Hi, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning and uh, data analytics course. Um, this video is from um, unit two of our course. Um, so here we're kind of covering uh, kind of a big picture thing. So we're looking at uh, an end-to-end -end machine learning project um, from like the, the chapter two of our textbook here. So in this video, I'm going to be concentrating on the data acquisition and exploration part of a machine learning, you know, of doing, of doing data analytics basically. All right. So um, our textbook has some nice handy checklists. Um, um, so, you know, so, so one of the goals of, of the textbook in this course is to give you a feel for, you know, what a working actual data scientist might do. OK, although in this course, we really only the, the, the purpose of, of, of the course that you're taking right now is to learn about the different machine learning models so that you can do kind of the exploration of, of, of models. Uh, so you can train different models and you kind of understand the internal workings of how they work so you can decide which model might work better or worst for a particular data set, that type of thing. So, so our course is mostly about exploring and fine-tuning and, and, and learning about the internals of machine learning models, okay? So you could have whole other courses on data exploration um, and data preparation and data cleaning, plus whole other courses on, you know, um, 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 production and, and uh, building um, um, interfaces to use products and things like that, right? So, um, but, but anyway, so, and, and so most of this course we won't be looking at issues of, of data exploration, things like that. So, so this, this is one of the only times where we kind of look at it um, a bit anyway, and give, give you a quick whirlwind introduction to it, okay? So um, I won't talk much about getting data. So, but for, for in our textbook, for each of the, for the overall checklist, each one of those items has an even more detailed sub checklist, right? So, you know, uh, we're going to use a data set that, that works well for purposes of, um, of of data exploration and cleaning to give you some ideas of the big picture things of what you would do as a data scientist in this chapter, okay? So, but but for a real, you know, project, you know, even before you begin, you have to worry about getting your data and, and you know, if you, to, if you have to get authorization to use it and, and um, um, uh, we will talk a little bit about data cleaning. So any real data set is going to have lots of quirks and things that you're going to have to interpret or clean up or, or you might have to merge several, several data sources together to get a clean data source, that type of thing. So, so working with the real world kind of data would be is, is real messy. And, and in fact, if I can go back to the previous slide here, a working data scientist probably spends much more of your time on these steps before, you know, actually training and building machine learning models or, 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 or model or, or um, data science models, right? So, so lots of your time is spent on exploration and cleaning and data acquisition and stuff like that. So, so it's an important topic. But anyway, in this video, we're mostly going to be looking at data exploration, okay? So, you know, we're, we're going to have a data uh, set that we've already gotten that's relatively clean, so we do have to do, uh, but, but we're going to show kind of some of the steps of how you would do, you know, explore it and visualize the data, uh, do some initial correlations, uh, you know, to, uh, so you can better understand your data set, okay? So data exploration is all about... Um, you know, you need to gather information so that you, before you can begin trying to build models, um, or else you won't be able to do very well at, at your the, the the thing that you really want to do. You know, which is model your data. So, so you need information about what's there, what the attributes are, what their ranges are. Um, you know, what, what noise they have, kind of what their distributions are, things like that. Okay, so that, that's kind of what this video is about here today. Um, all right, so um, currently in this course, um, the, the video we're going to be working on is the one called 2-1 Data Exploration. So this is from Chapter 2, um, and I've split it up into um, three videos here. So this is the first video of the three for our Unit 2, uh, Chapter 2 stuff. Um, so... So uh, before I get into the data, let, let, me, uh, let, me, let me kind of mention a few things about notational stuff because this will be used throughout this course, um, and if I haven't mentioned it yet, um, you ought to kind of understand this. So, so we're going to be using 
a, a, a data set of California census housing data, okay? And our overall big picture task is that we want to build a machine, machine learning model that can accurately predict the uh, median house value. So we want to, want to be able to predict housing prices for a district, okay? So we have information about districts in California. So you can think of these as like, you know, cities or, or um, uh, uh, townships or that kind of thing. So that level of, of population, all right? <coughs> and given information about the district, like the population, the, the median income of the people in there and things, we, we want to be able to predict what the housing, the, what the median house price would be for a house, to buy a house in that district. So, um, so this notational stuff here, though, is, is in general, so any data set that we work with is going to be formatted and laid out in this way, all right? So, so we're going to be using, we're going to read in this housing data here in just a bit, uh, just below here. Uh, if you look at it, it has 20, 000, a bit over 20,000 rows and 10 columns, okay? So all the data that we're going to be using in this class is going to be laid out as a two-dimensional matrix or as a two-dimensional table of data. And the rows, so the, the first dim dimension uh, in, in a shape like this represents the rows. And those are the samples um, or the, the, um, the instances of your data set. So in this case, the, the samples represent uh, uh, 20,640 districts in California, okay? So, so we've got, um, and, and normally, um, so we'll, we'll, generically we'll usually use M to represent the, the number of samples or the number of instances in our in our um, data set, okay? So here, M is 20,640, okay? And in this case, we've got 10 columns. Those, those are the attributes, or um, also I'll kind of call those the features, kind of interchangeably, right? So those represent the information. So each district has these 10 pieces of information about it, okay? And we'll, we'll generically use N normally to, uh, to keep track of the number of attributes or features, okay? So each district we have information about its location, latitude and longitude, um, the, the median income of the, <clears throat> of the people in that district, um, the, the average, um, actually for some reason in this data set we have the total rooms, so the, the you know so you know we don't we don't even know how many actual houses we have in this data set, but we, we know how many people you know the the, the population in this district, um, and uh, we know the total number of rooms they have. So if you, if you took all the houses and add up all the individual rooms, you'd come up with 919 rooms, and 213 bedrooms, and so on um, in this district here. And, and notice, these are all numerical attributes. We've got one attribute, which is uh, actually a category, which gives um, um, some information about how close or far away you are from the ocean here. Okay. Um, so um, um, I might leave this, because I'll, I'll do this again here later below, but you know, if you're working with like a, a data frame, so in this case, housing is going to be a data frame. So, so we'll either usually be using pandas data frames or regular NumPy arrays. But um, um, if you just access the first uh, index, you'll be accessing a particular row. So if I use the iloc for a data frame, I can access a particular instance. So in this case, I've gotten information about the, the fifth district or the fifth row of my table here. So that, that was the information I pulled out of here. Um, in a pandas data frame, you can access the columns by name. So if I want to get just the information about the total rooms, so, so that the, 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 the total rooms column here for all of my instances, I can just access total rooms. And here I get um, the, the total rooms column, but I just access the first five rows or the first five instances. So these are the total rooms in my first five districts, okay? Um, if you know if you know that that the that, that the third column so so actually you know column indexing starts at zero like row indexing starts at zero um, for for um, in general for arrays and lists and things in Python so here the um, total rooms is actually the, the third column from the uh, in this this data frame here so you can actually uh, um, also access it by the column index right. I point this out because uh, another generic name that we'll use a lot is we, we traditionally use X just for the name of, of that of this table of this two-dimensional t 
table of rows and columns of our data, right? <clears throat> um, and, and, you know, X can be a pandas data frame, or it can also be a regular NumPy array. And if it's a nu regular NumPy array, you, you, you don't have some of these nice things like being able to access columns by name and stuff, but you can always access uh, rows and columns by a, a numerical um, index, right? And you can always slice these, right? So, so what I'm using in both these cases is array slicing to get the first five um, instances or the first five rows. And then the second attribute is going to index into the columns. So this will get the third columns, which, as you've seen, is the total rooms, okay? So, but anyway, if, if you're using a regular NumPy array, you know, you can, you can get the same information. You can get that third column um, by at indexing into the second index into the array, and, and you can get rows or particular rows by accessing or slicing into the first um, <clears throat> index here. So yeah, traditionally X, you know, so we'll often use generically use X as the name of the input data, so, so the, the table of data. Um, and Y is typically used, lowercase Y is typically used as the, the name of the labels or the targets, okay? So I haven't mentioned yet, but in this data set we're going to be looking at, one of these, um, these features or one of these columns is actually the thing that we, we want to predict, okay? So we, we want to predict what the median house value is given these other nine attributes, all right? So we're actually going to pull this out into its own um, uh, array uh, later on when we do our machine learning modeling, and then we'll, then we'll just have these nine attributes plus some other attributes that we create. So um, anyway, so it, it's usually represented as lowercase y because it's just a vector, so a lot of the time when we're doing machine learning modeling, the output or the label or the target. So this goes by lots of different names. So it's the, the output you want to predict or the label or the target. Um, but since it's often usually just one um, piece of information, so one output you want to predict, uh, in mathematics, it, if it's just one, then it's, it's a vector of information. So we usually use lowercase letters to represent ve vectors and uppercase to, to represent matrix matrices. So that's why X is usually uppercase and Y is Usually, usually lowercase. It's a kind of a thing for mathematics here. All right. But you know, you should realize that y should should have m labels, right? So it should have one output label for each one of the um, uh, of the um, uh, instances or each one of the rows of our inputs that we're going to use. Right? So yeah, like I show here. Um, 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 so later on, we'll just take that row out uh, into a separate vector. Um, so we could have called that Y, or we could give it a more, you know, memorable name, housing labels, like in this case. So in this case, it'll be a vector with 20,640 labels um, that we're going to be trying to predict for our machine learning algorithm here, right? Um, okay. And kind of finally, before we get into things, you know, a little bit more um, notation here. So, um, so a, a common performance measure, so uh, we're, um, I'm really skipping ahead a little bit here um, because uh, we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail when we talk about actually building our predictor, building our machine learning model here. But you have to have some way of evaluating how well you're doing, okay? So, you know, intuitively you should understand. So if I make a prediction, how well I, my prediction is, how good it is, is, is going to be determined by how close it is to the actual value that I want to predict, okay? So in this case, if I'm trying to predict the, the median house value, the difference, the error, um, so, so, so th this notation here, the, 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 the subscript I um, in mathematical notation, that's really just doing an index, okay? So if, if I want to find the fifth instance, um, I would use the subscript i, and i would be 5 here. So if I want to know what the, the, the price is of my fifth, the median price of my fifth housing district, I, I would use uh, index 5 into the housing labels, uh, and that's really what the, the i subscript means here, okay? So, so you know, b later on we're going to be building our machine learning model, and really what the model does when you build it is you're building a hypothesis that given uh, uh, an, um, a, a, an instance, so given this information like the fifth district, 
um, you know, all these attributes of the fifth district. Um, I want our model, if I feed that in as input, I want it to give me a prediction of what, what it thinks the average house price is going to be. So the prediction, we use y hat, okay, it's, and it's just pronounced y hat. There's a little hat over it, okay. So our prediction for the for the i, you know, like the fifth one I'm using in my uh, uh, instance would come from running, you know, giving the fifth instance as input to my hypothesis and, and figuring out what it hypothesizes or what it predicts would be the housing price, okay? So then you can evaluate how well that prediction was by just doing a difference, okay? So in this case, since both of these are real value numbers, so, you know, since my house price is, our median house value is $269,000 for this district, if I guessed $280,000, I overshot a bit, but I'm off by a bit over ten thousand. You know, uh, not quite so, so ten thousand three hundred dollars if I um, estimate or make a prediction of twenty eight thousand. Right. So that that's that's just known as your error. Okay. So and then later on, um, then so overall the so that's just the error for one prediction, my fifth instance. So if you want to get an over, uh, uh, an idea of how I'm doing overall. You want to find the error for all of my instances. So I want to sum up over all of the M instances and find the error, right? Uh, then notice, though, that, that you have to be careful because I could have overshot, so I could have made my prediction too high, so in which case this difference would have been positive. But if I had undershot, my error would have been negative. So if you add up a bunch of positive and negatives, they, they, they'll tend to cancel each other out and you'll end up with zero. So you need to, to actually have the magnitude, so how far away you were, even whether it was plus or minus, okay? So you could use the absolute value, as our book talks about. Um, so that's known as the, um, the, uh, the, the, the absolute um, error, right? The sum of the absolute error, right? Uh, but we more typically square that value. So if, if you square the error, it, so negatives are going to get when they get squared will be returned into um, turned into a positive value, right? So you'll end up with something that measures the magnitude. Okay. So for various reasons that I'll probably talk about later in this course, it's, it's, we more typically use the the squared error uh, to 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 get this magnitude of the error here. But notice, you know, so if you if you square the error and you sum those all up, and then at the end you can take the square root to get it back into kind of your original. Um, um, attribute range, okay? So after you do this, the, the, the square root of that is going to give you kind of the average magnitude of your error, basically. So that, that's what the RMSE does here, right? Okay. So let's, let's, let's move on. Let's look at the actual data here. So um, um, in this case, we're actually, the, the, this data set isn't in your um, repository initially, so we actually download it from um, um, a website here. We're actually downloading it from our textbooks um, GitHub website to our own here. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and re-download it, although, you know, this, this code here, if you look at it, um, you'll find that it, um, um, it will try and detect whether the file is already there or not. It won't re-download it if it's already there, right? So, um, <clears throat> So I'm going to rerun, I'm going to um, clear out my notebook, um, and I'm going to go ahead and rerun it up to this point here. So, um, right. So, so uh, what it does here when we call the function fetch housing data um, is it will go and check. Um, so in this case, you know, the first time you do this, it should download it for you. Although, again, it's not very big. Although it, it is 500, it's half a megabyte for the compressed file. It un uncompresses to about one and a half megabytes um, here. All right. Uh, and then we load it. Okay, so um, this, this load housing data um, function here is just using pandas. So it just reads in the comma separated value from, from pandas. So the, the result is a um, <coughs> a regular data frame, okay, with with that many, you know, 20,640 rows uh, or, or instances of districts districts and 10 columns, all right? So, and, and I, as I showed above, you know, so, so if you want to, you can get the, the fifth instance by using iloc, you know, so you can get any particular instance you want. So if you want to see the, the last instance, 
So again, you know, since, since everything is zero indexed in Python, the valid indexes are going to be from zero to 20,639 for the for this number of instances. So I could, I could get the last district um, by pulling that up, right? Um, and like I said, you know, if I want to get the the, the columns, um, so if I want to get the um, 0, 1, 2, 3, if I, if I want to get total bedrooms, that's the fifth column, so I, I could use the name um, uh, like I do down here, I, or I could um, um, get the um, uh, the index and use that, okay? The reason why this is kind of useful is, is if you're using a regular NumPy array, basically whether you have a pandas data frame or a regular NumPy array, you can access a particular set of rows and a particular set of columns by doing slicing with the same notation, all right? So, so the, the particular rows that you want is, is your first index, and the particular columns or attributes that you want is your second index here, right? <clears throat> So, um, So again, like I said, um, so, so here, since this is a uh, pandas array, we have, we have more um, powerful ways that we can access things. So we can also access columns by name, so we can get um, rooms, or we can get um, the, the, the median um, income if we want to. Um, so here's the first five rows, you know, um, of our table here, um, so we can get, um, like, median income. So, I mean, at this point, we've, we've gotten past the data acquisition part, right? So, so we've actually acquired the data, and I kind of skipped over that. Uh, and so we're beginning our data exploration. So, I mean, our first thing is we have to identify, okay, what features do we actually have? And, well, you know, how many, how, you know, how many, what do I actually have in my data set? And how many instances or, or um, rows do I have in my data set? And what features do I have? And what are the attributes of my features? And that's what we're starting to do here, right? Um, Okay. So, like I said, you know, um, uh, we're, we're later going to be um, the the thing that we want to predict here is actually the um, the housing um, the the median house value, right? So, so we'll we'll pull that out. So, so this is really just a vector now of the house value um, in U.S. dollars um, for each of our um, um, 20,000 plus districts here, right? And if we want to get a particular value, you know, we can also use. So in this case, though, it's only one dimensional. So um, here, now, the, the I just is going to represent the, the, the row or the instance or, or actually the, the element of the vector that we want to access, all right? <coughs> Okay, so now we're going to get into kind of the, the data exploration proper. Okay, so the, the very first thing you'd want to do, kind of like I already did uh, above, is, you know, I want, I want to kind of look at the data. I want to get a sense of, of what um, what attributes I have, you know, after I figure out how many rows I have, you know. Um, so um, a useful thing if you, have a, if, if you have things in a pandas data frame is you can use some of these, these functions like info and, and describe to get some information, okay? So um, if you ask for info, so this is, this is helpful because um, it will give you kind of a preliminary, an, an explore, exploratory view of, your, um, of each of the features, basically, okay? So this is information you need to know. So most of my features are float 64 types, so that means that they're real valued numbers, so they have a number with a decimal place in there. So, so typical, you'll either get floats or ints, um, um, so although this might be like a int 64 or a u int 64 for unsigned int, something like that, okay? Or um, you might get some things that are object, okay? When you get something that's an object, what it usually is is that your data set has something that was encoded as a string value, okay? Now that string value could be a string, so, so it might be like a, a street address or something like that or a, a person's name. But in this case, uh, it might encode something else. So in this case, um, it's actually encoding, uh, I think I'm skipping ahead here, so we, we, we need to explore that. And so I, I kind of talk about it right here. Uh, but so the ocean proximity, though, is really what's known as a um, categorical um, variable or a categorical attribute, right? 
So, so yeah, value counts is very useful if you suspect something is a categorical. So if I do this, it will actually find all the unique values you know, so, and count them up and give you a table. So in this case, it's categorical and it's a, it's a discrete category, okay? So the, the very first thing you want to do for things that aren't numerical is, is you want to determine whether they're categorical or not or whether they're really strings, right? So, so categorical stuff is probably going to be very useful when you're doing your machine learning model. Strings you might have to convert into categories or do some other stuff with. But here we have a relatively fairly nice category. There's five um, discrete values, um, and and you know you can pretty much understand what the intention is. So you know we have things that are like uh, th that are like near the ocean or bay, so they're kind of near the beach. Um, then we have things that that are relatively close, less than an hour away. So so you might have to drive a bit. Uh, and then we have things further away, I, inland and, and island again. So a um, little bit skewed, so not, not a whole lot of, of official California districts um, on islands. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, later, to, I mean, to use this in a machine learning model, we can, machine learning models generally can't use strings. Um, it, it needs numbers. Um, and, and usually it's, you, you're going to want to have, fine, at the end, have floating point numbers, you know, real value numbers for all your inputs within a particular range, okay? So, so to use this categorical attribute, um, which could definitely be very useful, so, so it may, might make sense that things that are, you know, near the ocean or bay are going to be the high-priced pri pri high, um, uh, houses, right? And things inland will be less so intuitively um, so but, but yeah so, so we'll look at that actually probably in, I think it's in the next video so we'll, we'll look at kind of in our data cleaning um, ways that you might convert this into um, numerical value so you can use for machine learning all right so another nice function you might want to use um, is describe if you have a, a pandas data frame right so um, So this, one of the first things that this gives you, describe only works on numerical attributes. So you notice we don't get any information about the, um, the ocean proximity anymore. Um, so describe is just everything that it can see is a number. Um, it will calculate the, the average of it, the mean, and, and the variance or the, the standard deviation, um, and also calculate percentiles and give you the min and the max. So from here, you, you can begin to see what the range are of all these values. Um, but another thing you know, I should point out right here, uh, a very important thing that, uh, that you need to answer on, that, that you need an answer to um, quickly is, you know, what missing data do I have? Do I have any missing data um, and, and which things are missing? So you can begin to think about, okay, how am I going to handle the missing data? Okay? So missing data in a real data set um, is, is often a, a huge and complex problem that we're only going to touch on a bit um, uh, in this example that we do things with here. So here again, you know, uh, so you know, I should have mentioned here that our categorical attribute looks relatively clean here, so I didn't end up with a bunch of things like a, a couple of different spellings of inland or maybe like inland and, and um, 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 canyon, or, well, you know, so, some things that essentially mean the same thing that I'm going to have to gather together into one category. Or, you know, I didn't end up with, like, less than one hour, or somebody spelled it out, L-E-S-S, -S, and, you know. Um, so, so, so probably this is a little bit of cleaning has already been done on this data um, so that I, I, so things look relatively clean here for my category. Likewise here, it's probably pretty unlikely. So, I mean, pretty much everything uh, has the same count uh, that we were expecting, which is, you know, every district, has a longitude because the count is 20,640 and so on, except for one. One attribute has a few missing values, and it doesn't have very many, which is also, you know, a little bit unusual. So it's really only a little bit over 200 short of being complete here for the total bedrooms. But, but we do have 200 and some bedrooms um, that didn't have a value, um, a, a total bedrooms that didn't have a value. 
So when you have an attribute that the majority is missing, you know, that, that attribute, you know, at some point when you have over half or, or you know, more missing, uh, it becomes questionable whether that attribute is going to be really of value because you've got so much missing that it's hard to infer what the what the the things that are missing might be. But but the general way that you might handle missing data to skip ahead here is if I have enough information, I can do kind of a, a mini machine learning task. So I might want to predict or, or just kind of make up a number that seems reasonable um, of of what those missing values are based on the ones that I have. So, so in this case, you know, for each of my missing ones, I might try and find the most similar district and use that, for example, to fill in the missing value or, or something like that. Um, so, oh yeah, so, so um, uh, what we did, the count here, um, if I would have added these up, um, I would have been able to tell that I didn't have any missing values for my categorical one either. But but while we're thinking about missing values, you know, describe only gives you the information about the numerical values. So um, so you might want to go back and look for anything that's non-numerical and also make a note in your exploration notebook about um, uh, whether you've got to handle missing values and on non-numerical um, um, things as well, right? So, I mean, this, this is just a big table of numbers, so w humans are visual creatures, so this may not really give you a real good feel. So, uh, another thing that you really want to know is you want to know what the distributions are of, of the data, um, you know, for numerical categories like this. So, so this gives you, and, and you could we could also do a histogram of this as well to get um, a distribution of these. Um, but, um, but um, <clears throat> yeah, so, again, but default... I'm, I'm in the exploration phase. It's, it's a good idea, especially if you're using like a data, a pandas data frame, to use the built-in visualization. So this gives you very quickly some basic sorts of visualizations of, of things that you need when you're doing data exploration. So that's mostly what these plotting functions for panda data frames are used for for this data exploration phase here. So again, um, uh, by default. The histogram, if you call it on a data frame, will give you histograms for all the numerical attributes. Like describe gives this the summary table for all the numerical attributes, right? So it, it's important to understand the distributions because uh, so here you know uh, most things um, are not too most things are a little bit kind of long tailed. So that means that kind of one one side kind of tapers off, unlike the other side. Right. And the other notable thing that I think I just discussed here in the textbook to discuss those is one thing that quickly stands out to a practiced uh, a person who's, who's you know um, doing a lot of this kind of working with data. You know, these things here are obviously means that we've got some data clipping going on. Right. So so basically, the housing median age. Uh, if for any of the districts where the median age was more than fifty, um, they, they just um, entered it as 50 in, in the data set or, or 51 or whatever that value is, right? Um, yeah, and, and that's fine, you know, although, you know, that, that that's kind of a problem that you might have to deal with, right? But one that's really of particular concern, though, is, you know, since it's the median house value that we're trying to predict, uh, we, we noticed that there's um, some clipping going on here as well. So it looks like at 500,000, so, so no median house prices for districts above half a million dollars were entered. So if, if they were greater than that, they just entered it in as $500,000, right? So, I mean, that might be definitely problematic because that's the thing we're trying to predict, you know. So, so we're not going to be able to, to build a model that can predict things bigger than that from this data unless we either go back and... and, and 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 find the real medians for all these, or do you know get some additional data um, source information for for these things, right? So, um, you know, another thing I mean, some of these are a little bit bimodal, which can be problematic. So that's another thing to note. You know, so so you know things that are more like like a, if you know what a normal distribution is, that kind of have one peak. And then kind of look like a bell shape. Um, uh, tend to be the the 
things that aren't going to cause you problems when you use them with machine learning models and things that are more bimodal might have problematic again. Another thing the textbook knows, and this is the kind of thing, this is why you're doing this exploration like this, is that if, if you know kind of what income means, you know, so the income is, is like um, whether for either a person or a household, so this is probably meaning income per household, um, but it doesn't make any sense. So, so what does a, a median income of two mean here, three, right? I was expecting, you know, like, like knowing this is California, probably a median income of 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, something like that. So. Um, but yeah, like, like as, as the textbook explains, so that would be the kind of thing you would notice. And then you might go back to whoever collected this data, you know, and, and find out, you know, what does that mean? So, so build what's known as a data dictionary, okay? So what, what was actually done here is that, that the real incomes were, um, were normalized to a range from 1 to 15, basically. Right? But they end up with a, you know, a rough estimate for this is that each one of these represents in tens of thousands of dollars, so, which, which, which probably makes about sense. So, so, you know, so a 3 represents median incomes of probably about $30,000 know, in order to kind of interpret this um, in something that would make more sense. Us, so. <coughs> um, all right, so, so that was kind of um, some basic exploration, and we already began some visualizations, but at, at this point you might um, want to um, do some more detailed explorations and, and make some more detailed visualizations to gain better insights into the data set, right? Um, so, um, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm probably just going to really quickly gonna go through this here. Um, because this particular plot, I mean, you, you might do at this point, although the, the final result of this would also be a good final um, product that you might use for your final report or your final presentation about the results of, of your modeling of this data set, all right? So here, though, you know, in order to better understand the distribution of median house prices, we might want to use our data set to build um, a, a graphical model, right? So, so the, and, and this would be a good exercise when, when you're doing um, um, visualizations um, um, to gain insights here. So, so we, can, we can get a basic um, rough idea of the location by using the latitude and longitude information, right? So if we just directly plot those as, as the X and Y coordinates where longitude gives us, you know, the, the, the distribution in east to west, and latitude gives us the, the distribution from north to south, basically. <clears throat> right. So, so you see, I mean, you can see that, yeah, I mean, this, this is California, if, if you're familiar with, with the, the, the shape, shape of the United States state of California here. But one problem with this is that uh, when you do just a raw scatter, scatter plot like this, you can't get a good feel for the density of things here, right? So, so um, because a lot of these are overlapping, you could make you could make the um, um, these marker sizes smaller, which might help a little bit. Um, so I think that's marker size. Let, let's try like zero point one. Uh, no, it's not marker size, um, or maybe it's. size. Uh, here I would probably end up bringing up my help so since I can't quite remember. So so here uh, uh, we're using the plot again from directly from the data frame so we're using the plotting function of, pan, uh, of pandas here. <coughs> um, so I probably showed this in a previous notebook so I'm going to go ahead and bring up the contextual, uh, contextual help here. Um, I should have had this set up here since I wanted to do this. I don't know if it'll tell me. So if I bring up my contextual help for the plot, um, um, yeah, I don't see that. I'm probably gonna have to look at the the, the, the plot function from from matplotlib to get it. So I, I'm gonna kind of skip over that. So at this point, I would probably go off and just Google it uh, to, to to remember how how to, to change the marker size. But but uh, you know the point is is that um, get that contextual help a little bit smaller here. 
so I, I keep it out in case I need it. Um, but so, so the problem though is that we can't really get a good feel for the density here. So uh, a common way to handle that though, um, uh, a better way than changing the marker size, um, is to use the alpha, which which can controls the transparency. So if I plot these markers with an uh, with a transparency um, um, value and an alpha value point one, what happens is if I have a lot of thing, things on top of each other, they, they kind of fill in each other. So, so you can tell, so now you can get a better feel for the density of the um, districts, you know. And, and, and this makes this is, makes a better sense than, than, than what we saw here, because we, we can now clearly see the dense areas of the Bay Area and the Los Angeles area. Uh, in California here, and, and I didn't know this, but but yeah, the, the central district here, the, the textbook um, um, talks about it a little bit. So, uh, kind of the, the central central valley area here um, has, has some relatively dense areas, right? So, there's, there's a lot of the, the farming and a lot of the lower uh, income, you know, so so um, farm workers and migrant workers that working on on um, agricultural um, um, in the state, kind of in this area here, so. Um, anyway, so this is very common. So, so this is getting more useful, but, but what we really want to do is we want to visualize um, the, the, the housing price, okay? So we have no information about what the price is of the house. We only have information about the, the locations of, of our districts and now some visual information of the density of the districts here, right? Um, so um, we've only got two dimensions to work with. So a common thing, if you want to do more complex visualizations, uh, so we, we can use we can use color and size. Uh, oh, and I should have remembered. Yeah. So um, I actually did use the, um, the 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 size here in the plot. So it's just S or size, I guess, to to change the marker size. There we go. So that's what I was trying to do. Just size. Uh, I have to go back and read. So, so, but, but yeah, S S is the S is the thing. I think there's a fuller name. I just can't remember it. So yeah, that, that, that's what I was trying to do there. Um, but here, um, back to this one, we're going to use the most important one. We're going to use color to represent the median house price, the median house value here. So notice when we're using plot um, from um, a pandas data frame, uh, you can just pass in um, the, the 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 names of the columns, and it knows those, so it can use those for the for the the, the data frame. So here we're telling it to use this column uh, to to assign a color um, to each one of our markers here, and we'll also use the size of the marker. So so big districts that have big populations will end up with a, a bigger marker. And, Things that have you know small populations in the district end up with a tiny marker like I just did above there. Okay. <coughs> All right. So now this, this is very useful, and this is probably where I would stop if I was just doing data exploration. Is is this you know because now I can see and and, and this isn't unexpected, but so now I can see the Central Valley Valley, but this is the um, you know the, 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 the lots of relatively densely populated with with um, Lower medium price houses here, you know. So these aren't aren't the the, the real desirable properties. They're near, near the beach and stuff, right? Um, whereas is here, and we have our highest pop highest density of very high valued houses um, here in the Bay Area, San Francisco, um, and um, down in the Los Angeles area. Oh, and, and, you know, notice we used a, a color coding. So, like I said, we use color coding to represent the house values. So here, red or hot is going to be our higher median house values, although it's capped again at, at the, the half a million dollar house votes. Um, and and the, the dark blue um, is the lower one, right? So this, this kind of a summary image would, would actually be very useful, you know, if, at the end of this project, if I needed to present my results, um, you know, before I, I present my machine learning model to get people to understand kind of the layout of the data um, that we're trying to model here in California. So, um, 
so so yeah, if I was going to make this this figure or where our textbook makes this figure, um, we, we would clean this up so that we could present it to um, you know managers or uh, present it in a paper. That that mostly you know so a big thing is that you notice is that we we use a real map of California for the background, um, making certain that we line everything so that these are geographically at the correct places, right? But the other things that, that are just as important, so when you make, make a figure for a final report, whether it goes to like a scientific paper or to make a presentation before your manager, you, you need to, to make certain that everything, like all your uh, axes are labeled um, in ways that they will understand and all your um, um, legends are labeled. Uh, and here we, we've, we've labeled our color mapping with... Um, with, with uh, something that will mean uh, much, be much more useful to a, a casual observer of this visualization. So the, the housing price in th uh, uh, thousands of dollars, basically. All right. <coughs> okay, um, and I've already gone a little bit over what I wanted to on this video, but. Um, as a final thing, um, one of the final things that we mentioned in the data exploration, so the, the beginning of this, at this point, we've, we've gotten kind of a feel for which attributes we have and what their distributions are, and we've done some, some useful visualization so we have an idea of, of kind of what the data is that we want to model, a better idea of it, right? So now we want to maybe begin answering questions about which of those attributes are going to be most useful for building my machine learning models, okay? So normally the things that are highly correlated with what you're trying to predict are going to be the attributes or the features um, that are going to be of most use, okay? So that, that's what we're going to look at here. So a basic first step to do that is, is you want to um, calculate the correlations between each of the attributes um, and the attribute of, of interest, which is the median house price here, right? Um, so, uh, so here, so you can use uh, the, the, the core function um, calculates a standard correlation. It actually calculates a standard correlation between each attribute and every other attribute. So the result of this is actually a, a 10 by 10 sized matrix since housing currently has 10, has all 10 attributes in it right now, right? Um, although, um, yeah, it, it drops the non-numerical, so it's actually a 9 by 9 matrix because it can't really, until we convert the, so, so before I do this, I, if I wanted to know the correlations um, between the, um, um, the, 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 the proximity to ocean, um, I should have converted that into a numerical value as well, so I could have gotten its correlations as well, which... Uh, our textbook didn't do that, but I probably would have done that. Or, or the next step after this is I probably would have gone ahead and 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 um, made a preliminary conversion of that categorical attribute to a number, so I could also get the correlations of it um, as well here, right? So this gives you a standard correlation. It helps if you know some basic statistics here, um, and if you do, if you've never taken a statistic class, you might want to. Um, <clears throat> I'll give some resources. You might want to do a, a quick review of, of things like distributions um, um, and uh, what correlation means and some things like that. So, so this is a standard correlation or Pearson's. So here, you know, things that are one correspond to things that, that are highly corre correlated or exactly correlated, and negative one are going to be, they have a negative correlation, right? And zero means that they're not correlated. So anyway, if you if you just look at the, the 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 we just pulled out the things in relationship to the median house value. So any attribute is going to be exactly correlated with itself. So it's going to have a, an exact one to one correlation. But so the the interesting thing is the others, right? So so in particular, you know, these first three or four are telling us that that the the most useful attributes are probably going to be the median income, which is not surprising, you know. So so the the, the, the higher um, that, that people, the more money people make um, in, a, in a district uh, on average, or, uh, or the, the, the higher the, the houses are that, that they're going to be afford, going to want to afford and, and live in, right? 
Um, but yeah, total rooms and, and the, the median age is up there a bit, right? But negative correlations can be useful as well, um, right? So, so if, thing, if something is negatively correlated, still that would tell us that, you know, if, if it's low, that means that the, the housing price is going to be high or vice versa. So, um, but although here, the latitude um, is mostly negatively correlated because... Um, um, because we've got we've got two concentrations of the higher um, value um, house values, but and one of them is 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 is, is a very low um, latitude here, right? So that means that that, that there, there's a bigger preponderance of things of, of lower housing value above that. So 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 it's more likely as you go north um, uh, in latitude. Uh, that the, the housing prices will be less, even though we do have some bigger ones here kind of in the middle as well, right? So that negative correlation wouldn't have been so big if, you know, if, if the Bay Area had been at the very extreme northern part of the state. Then it would have more balanced out uh, each other, and you would have ended up with more of a zero correlation um, here for that attribute. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, those are numbers, but, um, um, you know, Humans being visual animals, um, you might want to actually scatter plot these all individually. So, so, so here again, we're going back to using basic plotting from um, um, pandas. So, if you do a scatter matrix again, it'll only do the numerical attributes. Uh, but here, you know, again, we can we can see. So, for for something that's positively correlated, uh, uh, you'll see things like this. And, and like this here, so so we can see that there's a, a positive correlation between the median income and our house value, which is the thing of interest, right? So we didn't show all these because we have what eight or nine attributes. Um, so so the, we only showed the ones that were kind of the top here, like the median income and the the total rooms and the, the housing median age here. So. Um, So, so yeah, the, these others besides the housing median income from this visualization are, are a little bit less clear that they have a correlation or not when you do a scatter plot like this. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you, you could focus in on I any of these if you wanted to. Like, like if you focus in on this, um, so it's, it's, it's tough to see uh, from the scatter matrix, but if I, if I focus in on that uh, median income, I mean, there's that good correlation, but again, you also get this artifact of, um, of of the capping that's being done. It's pretty obvious here, which again could be an issue. Another thing, though, is 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 here. It's it's it is obvious. We see kind of some some places that look like some some um, stratifications or some lines here, which which you know you, you definitely wouldn't pick out. You know, just looking at table numbers or or these these figures here make it tough to see, right? These are most likely you know, um, attributes of the human proclivity to uh, like nice round numbers. You know, when you're buying and selling things, you know, so probably like like this is probably like four hundred fifty thousand dollars right here, which is lots of things that, that were kind of close around there. Just uh, people kind of capped them, or uh, you know, or, or or settled down around there. You know, um, uh, at that nice round number, basically. Although I'm not completely convinced of that the, the book talks about that, so I'm not certain why there's not quite as clear a one at four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, right? But, but, but yeah, I mean, most likely it's something like that, right? Um, so, uh, and finally, um, at this point, we might be ready to. Um, to, to start thinking about, okay, some, some attributes we've identified are probably going to be most useful, but are there some data in there that we might like to have? Or, or a corresponding way of saying that is, could, could we make some of these attributes possibly more useful uh, to a machine learning algorithm, all right? Um, so... In, in this case, you know the, the the way that the data was was collected, where we just gave the the total number of rooms uh, in the district, is is um, um, it, 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 it makes more sense um, for a human. The, the the number that would be more 
understandable to us anyway would be, okay, what, what's the actual average number of rooms in each house in those districts, okay? So we don't really have that, but we can derive that um, um, because we do actually have the count of the number of households um, and, and that total room. So, so, so we could derive that, and, and, and that might be more useful than this because, because this, um, it, you have to do this kind of combination in order to get what the average is per household. You know? So, so, uh, so you'd, you'd be forcing the machine learning algorithm, if, it kind of, if, if this average is kind of useful, to, to learn to be able to do this on its own, to, to know that if I have a, a huge number of total rooms, it doesn't really mean as much if I also have a huge number of households, right? But if I have a whole a huge number of total rooms for a small, you know, relative to the number of households, that means I've got big houses with, with large numbers of rooms, right? So anyway, and, and you can have a similar question about bedrooms, right? Um, because we had total bedrooms. Um, and you might want to ask what the what the the actual number of people is on average in the house because you have the population and you have and you have the number of households um, in the district, right? So oh, notice here. I mean, you know, uh, we're actually adding these attributes to our housing data frame. So so you know, again, we should have covered the basics of this uh, if you go through the pandas video. But um, um, we derive a new attribute from existing columns, um, and then this assignment actually ends up creating a new column and adding it in. So now we've, we've added in um, four new columns. So we should have, what, 14 or 13 or 14 attributes now. <clears throat> so we could rerun our um, correlation here to see if those seem like they might be useful. A little bit surprising to me is, um, um, I mean, it, it does help. So if you go back and look at total rooms, you know, this rooms per household looks like it might be useful, right? So, so it makes a clearer signal than just um, to the, the total rooms or, or the number of households, right? <clears throat> uh, but the one that's surprising is uh, the, this manipulation for the bedrooms per room. It's, it's negatively correlated here. So this means that um, a smaller number of bedrooms seems to be correlated with higher housing prices, right? So I'll leave that as an exercise to you of, of why there would be a negative correlation there, possibly, right? But 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 right. But but now I mean this 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 actually here potentially you know so that's now bigger than any of the ones that we had before besides the median income in terms of magnitude of a correlation. So that that might be useful um, as well to our machine learning um, algorithm here. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of it for this video here. Um, so, um, like I said, th this in this video we're, we were mostly going through the the data exploration um, very quickly, right? So in the rest of this course, we'll, we'll mostly kind of skip over this this part. But it's good it's good to think about this. Um, um, uh, kind of uh, and understand. I mean, this this is a, a whole important topic in and of itself. You know, and this takes. For a real working data scientist, this, this takes quite a bit of your time doing tasks like this, okay? So hopefully that, that, was, that was useful to give you an idea of what you might want to do. You know, so if we do a project in this, this class like I sometimes do, you know, if you have an unknown data set, you'll want to kind of go back and look at this and do these similar kinds of things for a data set. Um, all right, so that's it for this video, um, and I will see you in the next one.